Welcome back to another episode of the Paralegal Voice on the Legal Talk Network. I'm your host, Jill Francisco, an advanced certified paralegal and past president of NILA. Also here today is my co-host, Tony Sipp, paralegal manager, and I'm going to start calling him the paralegal extraordinaire. <laughs> he didn't know that, but anyway, we, we can always change it. But, you know, Tony recently has joined me as my co-host, and I couldn't be more happy. So today we are super excited because we actually have a panel and um, we have never done a panel. At least I have not. Uh, obviously, Tony is not. So we're taking on big things today because this is a big deal. What we're talking about is a big deal. And so why not, you know, have a panel and really give it the tension and the uh, merit that it deserves. So joining me today, I'm just going to tell you who we have joining us today. I'm not going to really go in. They all have wonderful, extensive, you know, um, resumes. And we are going to hopefully include when we get this episode out, their information and website links and some documents. So if anybody, you know, hears anything, the listeners are interested and you want to hear more stuff and you want to follow up, we want you to be able to have that information readily available when the show is posted. So we will do our best to get that posted out there. So first I have joining us on the panel today is Alicia Mitchell Mercer. And she is the Director of Project Management at Lex Project Management Consulting Group. So welcome, Alicia. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for having me. So good to have you back. Let's say back, because remember. Back, for sure. (laughs) And also joining us today, we have S.M. Kernodal Hodges, which she is the Program Coordinator and Clerk for the Wake County Legal Support in North Carolina. Welcome, Kernodal. Thank you. And lastly, on our panel, we have Michael Holberg, Director of Special Projects at the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System at the University of Denver. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And I'm going to go ahead and just open up just real quick for each of them. I would like you guys just to say, if you want to say a little bit about yourself and just maybe your, you know, position or however you want to describe your involvement in, you know, what we're going to be talking about today is, you know, basically it all boils down to access to justice. And these three individuals have been very, very instrumental in getting you know, thing the initiative started, and Alicia is they're in North Carolina, and you know, doing um, and pushing for legislation. I mean, they've just been going, you know, really full steam ahead and getting this going. And we want to bring attention to all the good they've been doing and how much it's advancing. It's been work. I I talked to Alicia, and I think she said Alicia was a couple over a couple years. This has all been going on in North Carolina. Yes, I think yes. we started putting together our initial proposal for limited licensing in 2020, the end of 2020, and then we were studying it with the state bar, and now we've moved on to some other options, which we can cover in a bit. Awesome. What a time to start in COVID. You must have needed something to do. (laughs) Exactly. Right. (laughs) Completely bored, needed something to do. Completely bored. (laughs) If you know any of these people that we have on this panel, we know that none of us are bored. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, well, Alicia, why don't we just go back to you then and just you can give a little background and talk about uh, your position and how this is all coming together with with our awesome topic that we're discussing today. Okay, so my name is Alicia Mitchell Mercer, and I'm a legal project manager consultant in North Carolina. But as it relates to the access to justice conversation, I'm the co-founder of the North Carolina Justice for All Project with SM Cronoda Hodges, who's also on the panel with us. And we are working on legislative reform to assist legal aid in our state and also to assist the middle class with more affordable legal services. Awesome. So awesome. Kernodal, do you want to chime in right there with the other (laughs) co-founder? Yes. um, As she mentioned, I am also the co-founder of the North Carolina Justice Ball Project. I am currently at the Wake County Legal Support Center, and we are attempting to provide the community with the, uh, better access to justice and uh, more support services in our courthouse. Yes, and lastly, but not least, Michael. Yeah, so um, the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System, we like to go by aisles because it's a lot shorter, um, but we are a national independent research center and we really work to create innovative practical solutions to problems within the American legal system. And one of those that we saw that was gaining a lot of traction was these um, you know, legal paraprofessional or allied legal professional, the million different names that you want to call them. 
um, we saw these programs and states really, you know, gaining a lot of interest in learning more about them, wanting to create, potentially create one. And so we started um, working to do a lot of that background research that states were looking for in terms of what states, what other states were doing, what these programs look like and um, best practices for how could they could create their own. Wonderful. And like I said, I, I don't know, just real quick. I mean, like I was talking to Alicia and, you know, I, I was past president of Nile and I think like the triple LT as one of the names that you just alluded to different states called different things that I believe was in Washington. That was like one of the first. And I think that, you know, and at first it was panic, like, you know, like Nyla was just kind of keeping an eye on it because we're like, oh my gosh, you know, is this going to change our profession? Is this going to, you know, what is this going to do to us? And, you know, so back then we were just kind of, you know, taking taken, taken, sitting back and, you know, seeing what was going on. And then I think that kind of dropped off and now they're, you know, ramping back up. And then now, like you said, now a lot of other states are, you know, probably learning from, you know, their program and what they were doing and you get the positives and the concerns and the negatives. And, you know, uh, and so I think it's just kind of gone from there. But that's one of the things that I think that we want to start out to talk about today to kind of give everybody, you know, a basis for like what, what I know, and and well, let me back up. So Michael has a, you know, they have a, you have a report, the Landscape Allied Legal Professionals Report. Is that, I don't know if that's the formal, <laughs> <laughs> probably, it ha- probably has a few more words to that. But you know, what, and like you were just saying your purpose and what you started to do, because states were looking to, you know, for guidance and for things like that to get their uh, individual things. So like, what was the reason? Like, why did you feel like this was necessary? Like, why do you feel like you needed to get do this in the beginning? So first, states became interested in, like you said, Washington and their limited license, limited license legal technicians. That's why we say triple LT. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) um, But they started it in in 2012. And and the reason that they started and why other states have really gained traction is because of the access to justice crisis. And so what we have going on in the United States that I feel a lot of people, you know, who aren't really looking into the research often, which I don't. You know, I don't think a lot of people do because they're so busy with their their own daily jobs. It just happens to be my daily job. But there are over 70 percent of civil and family court cases have at least one party that is self-represented. When you look specifically at eviction and debt collection cases, that number jumps to over 90 percent in some jurisdictions. So these are many, many, many cases, many people that are going to court that are handling the entire um, portion of their case without an attorney, which is an extremely difficult thing to do. The World Justice Project in in 2021, they they rank countries for accessibility to court and legal services. The United States ranked 126 out of 139. I don't think that's where we want to be. And when we talk about this, a lot of people think, oh, this is a poor person's problem. Um, That, you know, this is something then let's look at legal aid. Let's look at pro bono. These are the only ways to solve this. But the truth is this really goes high up into the the middle income levels as well. Research shows also between 40 to 60 percent of the needs of middle income individuals go undressed as well. Unaddressed, excuse me. So this is a problem that reaches far at the in- income scale. So Washington really got started with it first in the United States. And then in 2018, Utah got started uh, with their program. And then it was the beginning of 2021, which is when IELTS really started to get started. And that is also when Arizona created their program and Minnesota created their pilot project um, to to test the waters for if something like this would work in their state. And I saw that there's a lot of interest from a lot of states, but what this is doing is it's, it's taking a lot of resources from these states. It's taking a lot of time. It's taking a lot of people hours. It's taking a lot just financially to create these committees. And what they're doing is they're trying, they're first exploring, you know, what are other states doing? What does this even look like? And so that's why IELTS decided to create the landscape report so the states can just have this one paper that they can look at and see, okay, here are all the states that are involved right now, and this is what their programs look like. We also saw, in addition to that, that once states found out, okay, this is what 
every other state that's involved, what their programs look like. They want to know, well, what's working based on data and best practices? What should we be doing? What's going to be, you know, really benefit our state? So what IELTS did with that is we um, hosted a convening where we brought together a lot of diverse experts that are, you know, in this field that are working in this area. We had representatives from three of, if not the three largest national paralegal organizations of NALA, um, NFPA, and um, AFP. And uh, because this, there are a lot of paralegals, I'm sure we're going to get more into this, but there are a lot of paralegals that are very interested and these programs are not solely for paralegals looking to advance their career, but very much there are avenues and pathways that paralegals can take to, to become these professionals. And so we held this convening to to develop recommendations on how states should develop their program. And um, that report's actually coming out next month. Oh, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted Tony to get a get a, get a word in here about, you know, what what you've been seeing out on your end, because obviously there's not much uh, going on here in West Virginia about that. But what are you seeing out there and, you know, in your area or heard or just kind of familiar with, you know? So I know that there's a lot of push for access to justice. A lot of the courts in L.A., uh, well, I'll just say California, had a big push to increase technology so it can make it more accessible for everyone. And it seems to be working so so far, right? We just want to expand it even more so. Um, so the courts are doing their part, at least out here. Well, I'll stop there <laughs> because <laughs> there's a lot that we can discuss and we have a lot of guests here. So I want to get their opinion because I was fascinated about it. Uh, right. And maybe I want to move on like Alicia and I, we were, Alicia, I don't know, you know, what exactly, you know, you want to talk, do you want to talk about, you know, like how North Carolina, I'm so excited about, we were talking about, you know, all the good things that's your, I feel like it's like the pilot. I don't know if that's right, but I feel like that's, you know, the pilot, the front runner, you, you got, you guys are, I mean, you've done a lot of things there, even with, you know, the starting out with the paralegals and the certification, you grown it into so much and now opening up like paralegals and like, like you said, legal professionals, it, but the paralegal is just easy to say because of the skill set as we were, you know, talking about, it's easy to to have that translate, but maybe talk about you all, you and Kanoto. I mean, you guys are the North Carolina you're in that area, if you guys want to talk about, you know, what's going on there and how you're doing there. Sure, I can I can talk a little bit about that. So I think North Carolina isn't really unique amongst the states with regards to the access to justice issues. I think every state is seeing kind of people struggling to be able to have their legal needs met. And then just this realization that when people have legal needs, a lot of these times they're basic human needs that they're trying to have fulfilled. So we're talking about things like shelter, um, being able to have a job to put food on the table, put a roof over their heads, um, safety. Sometimes we're talking about domestic violence and other issues like that that can be civil and maybe have a criminal element, but many times they're civil issues as well. And so in North Carolina, I think what we were coming to realize is in our work as paralegals, I've been paralegaling since 2003. <laughs> Um, and in my work, when I was working in family law, I would notice that we would have, you know, anecdotally, clients would come in um, and you would hear, you know, so-and-so schedule an appointment. Well, they come in, they do the consultation, and they realize during that consultation that they can't afford the retainer that the attorney is quoting. Um, right. Or they are halfway through their lawsuit and they run out of money and there's no one to borrow it from. So then they end up having to you know, to try and take care of these issues on their own. And so what we started thinking about was, you know, is there a way to reach out and help these people? Because these people, when they're turned away because they can't afford the services, they frequently aren't going to get help from legal aid either, right? Because you've right. got legal aid with their income caps, 16100 for a single person, around 33000 for a family of four. And so there really isn't another service provider to be able to assist those people that are in the access to justice gap. And as you know, like I do, I mean, the, the legal system is, it has its own lexicon. It is just <laughs> a very different um, kind of system yeah. to traverse. <laughs> And so if you don't have a lawyer, it becomes very difficult to have those basic needs met. 
Um, so this is not, you know, this is not like a luxury that we're trying to have met. This isn't like, you know, buying a new car necessarily. This is just about having basic needs met. So then we started talking about, you know, other professions, right? We are looking kind of at the stratification of other professions, say the medical industry, for example, how they have, we think about nurse practitioners. I mean, that's probably the closest alignment to what we're talking about, mm -hmm. but there's many more. There's, you know, phlebotanists and, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, physician assistants and all kinds of specialists that you can go to if you're having a medical problem. And the reason that that started in, in the 60s was because there was a shortage of providers. Um, and so now we're looking, if you get sick, you can go to urgent care and you can see a nurse practitioner ostensibly for less than it would take to go see a medical doctor. So just a couple more points of interest. I think, you know, in 2017, so this whole North Carolina Justice for All project was really Kernodal's brainchild, okay? She contacted me and this was something that had really been on her heart for a long time. And I'll let her talk about this. I don't wanna take away everything that she has to say, but I know she's very humble. So I wanna put some things out there. So Kernodal, she worked in law enforcement um, for 10 years, right? So she had, you know, that kind of that background. Um, and she hand. came to me and we were talking about the commission on the administration of law and justice in North Carolina. It was a commission that our formal, former Chief Justice Mark Martin had set up to kind of evaluate our court system and see where there were areas of opportunity for improvement. And so this is back in 2017. That commission actually made recommendations. There were five committees in that commission. There was the Legal Professionalism Committee, and they recommended looking at a second tier of legal profession professional to assist with the access to justice crisis. They also recommended wow. an innovation center be created so that we could keep up with the ever-changing ever-changing regulations and ever-changing legal system. So there were other recommendations that came out from other committees like raise the age. And there were some other things that they discussed, like we should be e-filing, you know, North Carolina was very <laughs> behind when it came to e-filing. And we watched with great interest to see if they would actually start to implement those changes. But by right. 2019, when we saw them start to focus on some of the other things, no one, it was like dead silent when it came to talking about any other kind of regulatory reform with regard to relaxing um, unauthorized practice of law statutes for a second tier. Um, so mm -hmm. that's when Kernodal came to me and started talking to me about, you know, what can we do to get something started? And so um, I'm gonna pass it on to Kernodal if she wants to kind of jump in there and tell me how she saw things from her perspective. I would say we both had the idea. Um, she does tell the story, then I harassed her through her <laughs> inbox a lot. Um, but eventually she <laughs> gave in and said, okay, we can have a conversation about it. And I will go back to what she said about me being in law enforcement. One of the things that I learned on the job was that when the judge says, ignorance of the law is not an excuse, they mean it. So people were going to jail every day because they just didn't understand not only how things were on a day-to-day -day basis in the court, but they also didn't understand legal language. And then the other barriers that people dealt with years ago when I was in law enforcement were just being able to read. Some were not able to write. So when you're arresting people or processing them and you're asking them, do you understand? The reality of it is the only thing they understood is if I sign here, I can go home. And if I say I'm going to show up in court and agree, then they'll let me go. That's really the gist of it. And I didn't feel comfortable with that because the flip side of that is the same reason that they would be incarcerated or detained is because they didn't know how to answer. They didn't understand what their rights were. When we started to weigh in on what we saw in North Carolina, we struggled to understand why there were all of these uh, commissions and agencies and offices, but still no resolution for a large portion of the community that needed support services. So visiting and revisiting the limited licensing became a conversation that eventually became an action because we chose to write the proposal because we wanted to bring to our state bar and our Supreme Court Justice, uh, Chief Justice Newby, who was the person we started with, who has been great throughout this process, just to see what their thought, thoughts were at this stage where we were. We've seen all the programs, we've done all the research, but we're not really seeing anything that's been implemented. 
And so we, I would say, somewhat waited for the push and went through the process. So we've had all the meetings. We've sat in on all the committees. And we like to say a committee for a committee for another committee. And uh, we still didn't have any resolution. <laughs> so most recently, and uh, I'm sure we're going to talk about it later, um, we have since decided to take it a step further uh, because we still see those in need. Michael mentioned earlier about the evictions. There was a study done in a census um, released in January 2022 that said 3.8 million people who were once under the COVID protection, the memorandum for eviction protection, would be homeless because there would be no no additional funding. There would be no additional services. So you had a lot of those people that needed legal service but couldn't afford an attorney, didn't know where to turn, and still were, were going to be evicted. So a lot of those issues are still evident right now in 2023. We need to see some change. The limited license in our mind or some form of alternative legal service is why we are pushing in North Carolina to see change and advocate for it because it needs to happen so that the families will benefit from it. Yeah, and thank thank you all three of you guys for explaining that because I think it's I think it's important, you know, for people to know, like I said, why this came about. And then we had, you know, you guys in you two in North Carolina that just was like you said, you see all of its like meetings for meetings on top of meetings, but there's never any action. And I think that at some point you just keep looking at yourself and going, you know, I want to do something. What can we do? So, you know, it's awesome that you guys got together and actually, like I said, turned some of the information, the data, the things that have been collected and the meeting, you know, from the meetings, because you do have to collaborate. You do have to, you know, gather your thoughts and gather information. I mean, obviously, that's an important thing to have. You need that when you're wanting to make change and to to implement new processes and things. So we have obviously a lot more that we want to discuss, but we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors and we'll come back and continue this conversation. Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local pre-screen process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry, connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high-volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. Hey, Guy, what's up? Just having some lunch, Conrad. Hey, Guy, do you see that billboard out there? Oh, you mean that guy out there in the gray suit? Yeah, the gray suit guy. Order up. There's uh, all those beautiful, rich, leather-bound books in the background. That is exactly the one. That's J.D. McGuffin at Law. He'll fight for you! I bet you he has got so many years of experience. Like decades and decades. And I bet, Guy, I bet he even went to a law school. Are you a lawyer? Do you suffer from dull marketing and a lack of positioning in a crowded legal marketplace? Sit down with Guy and Conrad for Lunch Hour Legal Marketing on the Legal Talk Network, available wherever podcasts are found. Thank you so much, and welcome back to the Paralegal Voice. I'm here with a panel of people today, along with my co-host, Tony, and we were going to jump back in here and talk about some obstacles, you know, because you always want to talk about the obstacles, the opposition, because uh, we don't need to tell you that with the paralegal skill set and other legal professionals, you know, that's one thing that we are trained, we have to be trained to deal with and be ready to, you know, answer to. But then also, those are sometimes the one that are given us <laughs> the uh, the obstacles. So I guess, you know, turn about fair play. So Alicia, I think you were going to begin and talk a little bit about some of the um, opposition, opposition, obstacles that you guys have had thrown at you? Sure. So I think when we put together our, our initial proposal for the limited licensing, that was that was just being sent to the state bar and being sent to the Supreme Court to kind of see if we could get some consensus or maybe build a coalition to try and address some of those issues that we were bringing up. Um, and when we submitted that to the state bar, they contacted us. They were in the middle of studying 
other topics that were related to regulatory reform and regulatory subcommittee. So we were appointed to that committee and we studied things like regulatory sandboxes, limited licensing, and some other types of regulatory reform for almost, I think the committee in total studied it for almost two years. We were a part of that committee for, I think, about 18 months. And so at the end of that study, the regulatory subcommittee actually voted in favor of the limited licensing, um, but there didn't seem to be an appetite to move forward with it after that vote happened. So, you know, at the state bar, there are committees, right? And you've got different levels of committees, and then you've got um, kind of the executive committee at the top, and it just wasn't really making the progress that we wanted to see. So instead, what happened was they decided to, in the summer of 2022, so a report came out in January 2022 recommending limited licensing from the state bar, and nothing nothing happened with that. And then in the summer, they, were, they decided to create a standing access to justice committee. And we asked to be appointed to that committee, um, and we were not selected for that committee, and we kind of waited to see what they would be discussing and they weren't really discussing limited licensing. So we were like, okay, what can we, what can we do at this point? So we did have a little bit of help along the way. I mean, actually a lot of help along the way we had at that time, he was a court of appeals judge, Richard Dietz, and he was kind of giving us his perspective on the access to justice crisis. He was taught, he actually told us about his upbringing and how he grew up from a family of limited means and what his family went through, what his mom went through when she needed legal help and couldn't get access to it. So he really had a heart for it. Um, and it was something that he really wanted to see himself. So um, now he is Justice Richard Dietz and we, you know, correspond with him occasionally to talk to him about you know, what his thoughts are in regards to what we're doing. But after the Access to Justice Standing Committee was created by the state bar and we didn't really see any movement, we thought we probably should go a different route, right? Well, like we knew that the end result had to be the General Assembly because in our state and every state is set up differently and Michael can touch on that. In our state, the General Assembly or the legislature has to change the, the law, the UPL, um, statutes in order to be able to license a second tier of legal professional. So mm. the efforts that we had put in beforehand were just to try and and see if we could go to the legislature together to make a change. So then the end of last year, 2022, I worked on a legislative proposal and a legislative policy, and we submitted that to our legislature in February of this year. And actually, Michael um, at Isles was very helpful. Um, he, he gave us a lot of great information to put into our legislative proposal, and he's been a great resource for just understanding more about the access to justice crisis. And cr- I don't know if Cronodal has anything in addition she wants to weigh in with regards to kind of where we are now and how we got here. The struggles that Alicia and Canodal have had in North Carolina, they're definitely not alone, but you know, we've seen a lot of differences just really fluctuating depending on the state. We have there are three states that looked into developing these, these programs that ultimately decided that they were going um, to pass on the opportunity, being California, Florida, and Illinois. But then and then Washington, they have an active program, but currently um, they can't have any additional triple LTs joining, but all the ones who ha- are currently licensed can continue to practice. And and so, you know, there's been some struggles there as well. And all of these have really been generated by attorneys. And it's almost exclusively attorneys. It's not it's not the public. We're not hearing from the public saying we don't want this we would never use this service. We only want an attorney's help. And, you know, if we can't afford it, I'd be happy to do it myself. We're not hearing that. Um, In fact, Arizona, they're one of the few states they actually put out a public survey as they were developing their program, asking, you know, giving them just some basic information on what these programs look like and saying, would you be interested in this? And it was, I think, between 70 to 80% of the respondents said yes. Um, that that they would be not interested surprising. in this. You know, it's, it's absolutely not surprising. And <laughs> and w- what's unfortunate that we're tr- one thing we're trying to change is a lot of states when they are beginning to develop or look into this, they have either a written comment that you know would go to either the bar, or the state supreme court, or uh, like public testimony that you can come and talk about whether you're in favor or against this. 
Well, these are usually posted on the state Supreme Court's website, the bar's website. Um, you don't have a lot of people from the public constantly going on there, seeing if there's opportunities for them to speak in front of the Supreme Court. So there's just, it, it's just really tailored for only attorneys to go and talk about this. And and they they have concerns that I personally don't think are are valid, but I think it's just a lack of understanding of the services that they provide and who they're providing it for, because the worry is that they're going to take their clients. But these are people who can't afford $5,000 retainers. I can't afford a $5,000 retainer or paying, you know, $300 to $500 an hour for uh, any, any sort of legal help. And so there's huge support from the public when they are asked. And actually when attorneys know about this, and and understand it and work with these professionals, they are very interested in and and on board as well. And I think the perfect example of that is Minnesota. They have it's just a pilot project right now, but they have um, in order for them to work, they have to be under the supervision of an attorney. And what goes along with that is that they actually are working under the attorney's license. And so if they mess up. It's the attorney's license and the attorney that could, you know, potentially be suspended from working or what. So it's a pretty serious role. And a survey went out to those supervising attorneys asking, you know, how is it going? What do you think? And they actually asked for the roles of their legal paraprofessionals, what they call them, to be expanded and to go actually into um, work on areas that are more difficult. And and they're allowing their legal paraprofessionals to go to court by themselves to represent their clients. So it, it's showing that there's a lot of, there is a lot of interest once attorneys understand and work with them and see just how capable they are. It's funny because you said, so currently working under the supervision of an attorney, which obviously is what, you know, we're used to hearing and 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 knowing now. So do you think, I mean, do, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, playing devil, devil's advocate kind of, but I mean, is that, do you think it's, it's only working because still you're under that, you know, you're under them? You know what I mean? Like, is that why they're, you know? Yeah, so absolutely not, (laughs) thankfully. um, Because they're, so they're out of the active states right now, they're the only ones that are requiring attorney supervision. So Washington did not, um, Arizona, Utah, they also do not. And then Oregon is going to be implementing their program later this year, and they will not be requiring it as well. So the majority of states that are looking in and actually creating these programs, they're not requiring attorney supervision because they, they've seen the data, they know it's not necessary. Right. And there's, um, you know, been like interviews of, or like asking clients or asking even judges, like, how did, you know, how did this person do in court? How, you know, did they understand what they were doing? Did they represent their client well? And it's really just been rave reviews. And so an attorney supervision is not needed. And I don't think that's going to be the common practice in any way. Great, great. And that's, yeah, and that's, like I said, and that's what we need to get. I mean, that's kind of like you said, the whole purpose that you're getting more and more. And like you said, the positive feedback is only hopefully going to, you know, allow expansion and, you know, create the good examples and, you know, go more instead of back or stagnant or stay, you know, and go, go less. So, okay, we have to take another quick break to thank our sponsors. And then we'll come right back to final up with this great panel we have today. Oh, welcome back to the Paralegal Voice. And we want to get right back into our conversation of wonderful information and things about the access to justice. And I have the panel members here that I want to give them all kind of one more chance to, you know, give some final thoughts, maybe what they think, um, you know, is is happening, is coming next, is, you know, they're hoping to happen. I know there's things out there that you have, you're pending, that's uh, coming up. And um, I just want to let everybody know those thoughts so you know they can they can be ready when you know these great things continue to happen hopefully because I feel like that's we're making we're making progress (laughs) so Alicia do you want to start on that sure so I, I think when Michael was talking earlier about you know barriers there being both positive and negative aspects to going through this process one of the things that I know that has been brought up throughout our throughout our journey has been the issue of public harm And so we talked a little bit about the competition piece, I think, but the public harm, a lot of attorneys seem to bring that up as 
an issue that needs to be addressed. And I think one of the important things to note is that none of the programs that are currently being considered or have already been implemented are suggesting that paralegals should just be given a license like right now, you're just ready to go out there and practice law. They've been very carefully crafted to consider what education components might be necessary, what additional training, what experience might be necessary. And also this license, it's a limited license, right? So it's not a license to go out and practice any kind of law you want to practice. Typically the license is in a specific area of practice. So for example, maybe you have a limited license in family law, you might have Mm -hmm. a limited license in, you know, debtor creditor issues, things of that nature. Every state is doing something different. But when it comes to the issue of public harm, you know, I had a lot of questions about that myself. And when I was speaking to um, Scotty Hill at Utah, I, I book her every one, every once in a while, and I think <laughs> I last spoke to her in December, and I asked her, since your program's been around since 2000, I think 19, have you seen, you know, have you had any incidences of public harm? And at this time, I was putting together my proposal, and she said they had not had any reports of public or harm from their from wow. the people who had a license. And I found that in all of the states that I asked that question to, they were telling me that the incidences of public harm were non-existent or at least no higher than what they were seeing in the attorney population. So I do think, I agree with Michael, that sometimes these issues are about educating lawyers and other stakeholders so that they can understand what the concerns are. I think it's about, you know, building um, relationships and being able to come together to have a conversation about how we can best serve the needs of the public and making sure that we put the needs of the public first, not the paralegal profession. Even though we talk about paralegals as having the skill set to be able to meet these needs, this is not about advancing the paralegal career. Sorry, Jill. Um, this (laughs) This is really about access to justice and making sure that people who need legal help are getting legal help. This is not about lawyers. And this is not about, you know, the prestige or the whatever comes along with being a lawyer. This is about helping people in need. And really, if the whole purpose of the legal system is to make sure that there is justice and fairness and equity, are we really doing the right thing by people by not considering these other options that might help them? Right. And I'm glad you brought that up about not... (laughs) About advancing the parallel work, because honestly, no, it's a good point. And I think like, it, you know, people we were talking, we've talked in the past where both you and I have worked in the paralegal profession for many years, you know, 20 plus years, there's a lot in that category. And I think that sometimes it's like, it's not necessarily advancing, it's finding something that's all of a sudden, you know, speaks to you, there's a cause, there's something different, there's a there, you want to make a difference, you've been doing, you know, XYZ, and maybe you've helped, you know, and hopefully you've helped clients, you know, whoever they may be, but now now it's time, like, you know, it's speaking to you, you've been in there a long time to do something else. And I, so to me, it's more to me like an opportunity to help the access to justice, because that is the purpose is, you know, furthering that getting more people access to justice, getting those people help that they need, and, you know, getting the whole them be able to access the, the legal services that they don't have. And, you know, you and I have talked about before where those people, you know, the, the whole competition thing, we we kind of, you know, laugh a little bit about it because it's like those people aren't going to attorneys. They're not losing those people because they weren't going to attorneys anyway, you know, and now you're just going to fill that void for them and be able to help them. And so that brings up a good point, but I do, I do agree with you, but you, you, <laughs> but you, you know, you know how I am though. So I'm glad you bring that up. Kernodal, would you like to piggyback on any of that and, and go into, to your points? Absolutely. Uh, I think it's a perfect segue into talking about the people component of things. Uh, that's what drives me. And I kind of take Alicia uh, down with me um, when it comes to the people component. Just, you know, in the county where I currently serve, is, our center has only been open 60 days. We have service over 700 people, and we're only open right now four hours a day. That should focus the demand. A lot of what Michael said earlier in the segment about the legal fees, we're seeing a growing number of people come in and say, our attorneys say if we file our own documents, it'll cut down on our costs. And the going cost is that $300 an hour. So they're having their clients come in and file, and they're sending them to the support center so that we can walk them through how to file 
And because we've currently gone to an electronic filing process, that takes even more time. When you look at a county as large as the one that we're in, we service 1.15 million residents. And we have to turn people away because we close at a certain time. But to have that demand in 60 days and have 700 people come in lets us know we're making a difference, but there's so much more that can be done. Having something like the limited license in place will create another option for families because a lot of these people do still need legal representation. Support services are fine, but it's just not enough. And you're going to hear that over and over and all of the conversations that you have. It's so much more that needs to be done. This one thing will not rule out the other and will never outweigh attorneys. There will always be a need for legal representation. But I think that when we start to consider who's really being harmed, the public is being harmed the longer we take to implement something that will better serve them. That's just amazing. That's amazing stats, 60 days and and that much. So that tells you, like you said, that you, you're definitely, there's a need and, but, but like you said, that's not enough. There needs to be more and that, but you know, that's, that's, I mean, it's not, it's not good that there's that much of a need. Obviously we're sad that there is that much of a need, but that also, like I said, shows that it, I think that'll propel you into the next step. You know, it'll, it'll show that there, you know, there, there's a need and you need to keep going on that, on that track. So Michael last, but again, not least. <laughs> Thanks. So I'd say three different points. One is that these programs are working with, you know, the data we have is showing that they're providing competent legal services and it's at about half the cost of attorneys. So this is hitting a huge number of people that wouldn't be able to afford legal services. So it's working. In addition Second point is, this is a great opportunity for paralegals. As Alicia said, you know, this this was not developed for just solely for paralegals and to advance paralegals, but it is still a great opportunity for paralegals. And one thing that I'm seeing with all these states, especially when they're developing their education and practical training requirements, is they have multiple pathways of how you can become a, an allied legal professional. And one of those ways often one of those pathways is through some sort of certification as a paralegal. And so there's great opportunity there. And then last I'll say is if you are interested, but you you think your state isn't doing anything, there's a lot of states that are really starting to consider this and look into it. You just may not know about it. And so reach out to either your local, whether it's a paralegal association or whatever professional association, and, and start finding out what's going on. And if nothing's going on, Alicia and Canola are the most perfect examples I can think of, of you make something happen. They, I would say they'll help us out. Give us, get us a start. And uh, because, well, and, and that that's, and honestly, I mean, I know that they'll both uh, agree with me as Tony. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that's a paralegal skill set is get it done. I mean, we're the ones in there getting it done, putting, putting, putting it to action. So Tony, just a little words that you'd like to add on there. Uh, no, I, I am I'm so glad that you all are doing this. Access to a justice is uh, obviously very important. Keep up the good work. Um, I want to see more of this. I want to see more of you and more data so that we can uh, start to spin it in California as well. For sure. So, yes, thank you so much, um, each of you, for joining us. And like I said, we are definitely going to provide each of your contact information and websites and, you know, the helpful information so people can, um, you know, if there's people, like you said, that want to do this, that it's not happening in their area, you know, that they can they can look into making something happen because that's really what we're doing here. You know, the more the more the merrier in this type of situation. There's need everywhere. I don't know where you can say that everybody's fine and everybody's getting everything they need. I don't I don't know where that is. Maybe, you know, just world or something, but not not in the legal world. So we're going to we're going to post that information. And like I said, I really appreciate you guys taking your time today and to speak to our listeners and tell all the good and uh, that you guys are doing. And I know that um, we'll continue to do so. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Tony, do you want to give your contact information first? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, it's it's on LinkedIn. It's uh, my name, T-O-N-Y-S-I-P-P, Tony Sip. Take a sip of coffee. 
and I will add you. <laughs> right. And I can be reached, of course, at J Francisco at Logical dot com if anybody would like to reach out to me and alicia do you want to provide same are you linkedin is that your best mode of contact yes i'm alicia mitchell mercer on linkedin and if anyone wanted to contact us at the north carolina justice for all project that would be advocacy at ncjfap.org so ncjfap.org and canodal is your mode on linkedin also your your preference preferred contact Yes, it is going to be S.M. Cronodal Hodges, and it will be found on LinkedIn as well. Okay, thank you so much. And Michael, lastly, what's your preferred method? (laughs) I am never on LinkedIn, so I would not do that. (laughs) Uh, Don't do that for Michael. (laughs) I I think just my email, which is michael.holberg at du.edu. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for our listeners for joining us. We'll signing off, and we hope to see you next month. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer 